It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and we're at the midway point of June 2006, June 16th to be exact. Well, we've got four movies to look at, and um, couple, again, once again, some notable movies, including the follow-up to Napoleon Dynamite for its director, starring Jack Black. We also have um, the Fast and Furious 3, if you want to call it, except literally nobody from the previous two movies is, are in it for the most part. Uh, Sandra Bullock and Keanu Reeves reunite for the first time since Speed. And, uh, you know, the sequel that everyone's been waiting to hear about, everyone's been waiting for, Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. Because, yeah, that's what the kids have been waiting for. Uh, we'll delve into that as we go along here. But first, let's talk about the biggest new release of the weekend, which is, of course, Jack Black starring as Nacho Libre. So in the film, Jack Black stars as Ignacio, a disrespected cook in a Mexican monastery that can barely afford to feed the orphans who live there. He's inspired by a local wrestling hero and decides to moonlight as the not-so-famous luchador Nacho Libre to earn money from the monastery, not to mention the admiration of a beautiful nun, Sister Encarnacion, played by um, Ana de la Regula? I think that's her. I think she was, she was also in Cop Out, too, if I remember correctly. Yes, I was right on. Ana de la Reg Reguera. And, um, yeah, this movie has a lot of problems to it. The biggest problem with the movie mostly stems from the script itself. This was co-written by Mike White, who did The School of Rock with Jack Black. And you also have the unique writing style of Jared and Jerusha Hess, of course, the people behind Napoleon Dynamite. So it's one of those movies that has two different versions of comedic writing trying to come together. And it just doesn't really blend well here, not to mention... All the cliched elements that are shown are, are all throughout this entire movie. It's just, it's a mess all around. Jack Black is perfectly fine in it. He does deliver some decently comedic moments throughout the film, and he does have a likable personality to it. Everybody else is kind of bland and generic. Nothing, nobody really took off in this movie to make much of an impact. The music really is off in this movie. You really can't go wrong with Danny Elfman overall, but here, he seemed like he was really forcing it in here, and he kind of was. Like, it literally... Uh, Hess originally wanted the uh, Beck to do the soundtrack for the film. Beck had been a fan of Hess with the Pony Dynamite. He accepted, but Paramount didn't think that Beck style fit the film and decided to get Danny Elfman to replace him. So Elfman had to basically rewrite a script th literally weeks before the movie came out. However, only about two thirds of the, the film and the score ended up being in the movie. But then again, when you start in May of 2006, you have to get this out by June 16th. Yeah, that's. Um, that's probably going to be a main reason why the music seems off here. Due to how much of Elfman's music filled the film, Elfman's, Elfman's representatives asked that Elfman be the only person credited for the score, and Hess actually caught wind of this and would not allow the studio to remove Beck from the credits. When finding that he would not have the only music credit, Elfman told Paramount to remove his name from the film, and an agreement was eventually reached where both of them were credited for the respective parts of the scene. So, like I said before, they brought Elfman to write a full score for this mo and record it be a month before the film's actual release. So there's already a disconnect of what kind of a music should fit this story in general. And Nacho Libre wants to tell a unique story to it, but it's so jumbled on so many levels. From the script, to the music, to the style of comedy they want to go with. Jack Black does a decent job carrying the film on his own, but other than that... There's just nothing about the movie that works overall. It's not a bad movie, but it's just one of those ones that had unfigured out pur a purpose for existence. And it doesn't make it worth it to watch it over and over again. It begins to kind of show the flaws of the Napoleon Dynamite director, Jared Hess, as a whole. Because what followed after this was not a very good so stretch of movies. Um, especially General Broncos. Even to today, with that Minecraft movie he's working on. But, um, then again, that's still about a, a couple weeks, months away. So we'll see what happens there. But, um... So that's Nacho Libre, so uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the next movie we have here, and that is The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift. Seen by many at the time as the bottom of the barrel for the Fast and Furious movies, but oh, <laughs> wait until we get to the later movies. But um, this is the third installment in the Fast and Furious series. It's a standalone sequel to the other two movies, and the fact that literally nobody from the previous two movies are in this film. You have Lucas Black uh, starring as a car enthusiast who is sent to live in Tokyo with his estranged father and finds solace exploring the city's drifting community with uh, Bow Wow as one of the people involved in here. Now, this movie bit did flop, however, however, this movie is notable for a number of different reasons for why the Fast and Furious series would eventually turn itself around a couple years from now, because it's directed by Justin Lin, the writer of this is Chris Morgan, the actor Sung Kang is in this movie, and of course, Brian Tyler does the music for this. 
all four of those components would return in the next film. And uh, eventually from that fo point forward, the series got better and better and better until it eventually fell off, starting with The Fate of the Furious. And, um, but yeah, there's no denying that this movie... This movie really didn't work that well. It, I mean, yeah, the action sequences are still pretty cool in general, but the story, the characters overall are not really that inventive and really that, that interesting overall. And like I said, these would be better examined in future movies, starting with uh, Fast and Furious. And after that, it's just kind of like, yeah, there's just literally nothing here of value whatsoever to really make this somewhat of an enjoyable movie in general, even with the nice, visual, the, the nice action sequences overall. But other than that, though, yeah, definitely... Definitely not one of the better Fast and Furious movies, but then again, like I said, it only gets worse from there because, you know, Fate of the Furious, uh, F, F, uh, uh, I was going to say F9, but Fast X is another one that's pretty bad, but I think those movies are worse than this one is. This is probably my third least favorite of the series in general. So, yeah, but like I said, it does get better from here, starting with the next movie that comes out, but that's still about a couple years away, so. That's the Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift for you, so let's go ahead and move on to our next movie, and that is the reunion of Keanu Reeves and Sandra Bullock, 20, 12 years after Speed, in a much different movie in general. This is the romantic drama, the, um, I forgot the title for a second, The Lake House. A pretty good concept overall here. This is actually a remake of a South Korean film called Il Mar. And it stars like Keanu Reeves as an architect living in 2004 and a doctor, played by Sandra Bullock, living in 2006, who meet via letters left in the mailbox of a lake house where they both lived at separate points in time. They carry on this two-year correspondence while remaining separated by their time differences, and it makes for a very interesting film in general. Does it work all the way through? Not really, but you do... You do remember that great chemistry that Reeves and Bullock had in Speed, and it definitely shows up in this movie. These two really do work off each other very well, even though they're not really to get they're not really together on screen for a major for a mass majority of the movie in general. And it makes for it does it does carry the film over to a level. I would say that yeah, it makes it worth it in the end. I think as a story, it's pretty much it's pretty much the predictable rom com material that you kind of get used to get seeing in these films like this, but. Like I said, I think the concept is so good on its own that I think it does carry itself to being one of the better romantic dramas as a whole. It's a really in impressively put together movie, a very fun little concept in general. Um, definitely has its flaws to it, but definitely not a bad movie either. It's still a, it's still a film I thought was surprisingly enjoyable, and one I would definitely recommend checking out. Even if you're not a big romantic drama person in general, this one definitely works works much better than you think it would, so... So with that said, let's go ahead and get to our last movie, and that is the sequel that everyone was demanding for, if you were living in Britain. Uh, this is uh, Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties. Yeah, Garfield, A Tale of Two Kitties, the movie that was part of a contractual obligation for Bill Murray to return in, and was only made because the British literally... They, the first Garfield movie, the big hit that it was, that they had no choice but to make a sequel. So let's go ahead and make it in Brit in uh, London, in the UK. Why not? And uh, in this movie, Garfield, Odie, Liz, and John travel to the United Kingdom where Prince, another cat that looks exactly like Garfield, is ruling over a castle after the death of his owner. His reign is soon jeopardized by an evil aristocrat played by Billy C Connolly who plans to remodel the castle in con into condominiums, destroying the estate and getting rid of Prince. So yeah, it's pretty much the Prince and the Pauper, mixed with a little bit of the Aristocats, too, except the fact that the Aristocats, uh, you know, yes, it actually, no, it is very much like the Aristocats in general, and yeah, it's that, this movie is definitely not any better than that, or the Prince and the Pauper, the Mickey Mouse Prince and the Pauper, which, if you want to see a really good version of that storyline, go watch that. This is about as bad as it gets. It's a lazy film. It's another movie that you could tell that everyone didn't want to do. They were contractually obligated to do it because the first movie was such a success, especially Bill Murray. And it's just, it's just not, fun. it's just not a good movie, man. It's just another movie that just completely insults what makes Garfield such a unique and fun character as a whole. And why I give more credit to the Garfield movie that came out recently for doing a better job of understanding what Garfield is, even though. Most people don't. Most people have a mixed opinion on Chris Pratt as Garfield, which I didn't think he. I thought it was actually not that bad as Garfield, but this is a pretty bad movie in general. And on top of that, wasting a really good cast involved in here. Like you have Billy Connolly, 
you have Ian Abercrombie, you know, um, uh, uh, Elaine's boss from Seinfeld, not not John O'Hurley, the, uh, the, uh, I can't remember his name, please let it be over this time, just Mr. Pitt, okay, thank you, uh, but, um, you have Roger Reeves, you have Lucy Davis, you have, um, Tim Curry, Bob Hoskins, Reese Ethens, Vinnie Jones, Richard E. Grant, Jane Leaves, a strong cast in this movie, and they're given nothing to do in here because the script is so poorly put together. You could just tell that the studio just put this together in like five minutes because, you know, they you know the first movie was a success, got to make a sequel so quickly, and um, apparently this was good enough for the director of this, Tim Hill, to get the Alvin and the Chipmunks movie that came after this, because the, literally the year afterwards he was directing an Alvin, Alvin and the Chipmunks, the first one, which, truth be told, is the best of those movies, but that's really not saying a whole lot in general. Uh, this, yeah, this movie is pretty bad. This is a movie that is not very entertaining, it's very lackluster, and just shows a lot of the same problems with the other Garfield movie, but... It's about on par with the other one in general. Not that it's nothing too spectacular, nothing too amazing. It's not even a movie that I would say is great in general. It's not even a good movie to begin with. It's just a waste of p pure opportunity. That like Garfield deserves way better movies than this. Like he deserve like Garfield deserves more more than these movies in general. But like I said, if it wasn't for these movies, we wouldn't have gotten Garfield and Friends on DVD. So at least there's that. So that's probably the best thing I can say about it, is the fact that. Yeah, these movies are terrible, but thank God we got Garfield and Friends on DVD because of these movies. So, take that for what you will, and I think you can pretty much say that this that's the only good thing that came out of these movies in general. So, yeah, that's a hard skip on Garfield and Tale of Two Kitties. And so, with that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. Now, the next time we meet, we'll take a look at the weekend of June 23rd with only two movies to look at. Uh, we have Adam Sandler starring in maybe one of his better movies in general coming from this time period, Click. Uh, we also have Waist Deep with uh, Tyrese and Megan Good involved in it. Uh, just those two movies in general. We'll take a look at them both on the next episode. That'll be coming up tomorrow. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode. Also, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button because we post videos here every day. And you get updates on when new videos come out. Now, with all that said, I am off. I will see you guys next time. And until then, as always, take care.